In this video, I'm going to talk about servos, what servos are, how they function, and investigate servos in detail so we'll know how to program for them. A servo is a motor that uses feedback to control its position. This is also called a closed loop system. The components of a servo consists of a motor, which may look like this. It has also a device that understands its position, and it would also contain electronics to be able to have the position fed back into the electronics to control the motor's position. In this particular configuration, we have a motor. We have what is called an encoder, which is just a wheel that has some slits in it. And this part right here has a, a light and a device that reads the light. And if it sees light, then it is a pulse. If it doesn't have a light, it would be equivalent to like maybe a zero volts. And the light with its receiver acts as a switch, turning on and off every, every time this turns. If you tell a motor to turn five of these positions, it will turn to the fifth position from where it started and then halt the motor. If the motor was forced into another position, even though it was trying to stay at five, it will know that it's gone past the five and it will reverse back to that fifth position. On some servos, the electronics like this one would be external from the, the motor and the encoder. You'll also have configurations where the motor has an encoder that has much finer resolution. You can see that this is a piece of plastic and the encoder actually has little tiny lines um, that in this particular photo it just looks like it's gray because the lines are too thin to be able to see. Even with this macro lens, it's difficult to see the little lines. There are also digital servos like the one seen here. This one is from Dynamixel. This is the AX12. And servos also come in much larger sizes for industrial use. Hobby servos are the most popular type. And we're going to take a look inside and see how this one works. All of the electronics are within the casing of this servo. And you have what is called the horn. At this location, you'll have many gears, you'll have the electronics, and you'll have a way for the, the motor to know its position, which is done using a potentiometer. So let's go ahead and take this one apart and see how this one works. There are four really long screws in the back. And these screws actually fasten all the way to this point. You'll see how long they are here. And you'll first see that there's a gear set inside. Should remove this first. Okay. So this is what the gear set looks like. And you'll have gears that connect from the uh, device that is going to know the position of the motor and it's going to connect to the motor. And it will also um, have a lot of gear reduction, so you'll have some precision in the, um, in the actual main part of the motor. And it'll also um, increase, when you gear down, it'll increase the torque that you get. So the motor is going to be spinning really, really fast, and this part is going to be spinning um, relatively slowly. So it'll give you more torque, which is, it'll give you uh, more strength as it turns. We're going to take all of these um, gears off, but I also wanted to show you one portion of it and there is a, a little tab here that um, um, Keeps it from turning too far in one direction So it'll only be able to go 180 degrees around and a lot of people actually remove this um, Portion of it so it can be a continuous turning servo. So let's take off the gears And you'll want to try to remember where these gears were before and I'm only removing the gears because I'm going to be handling this so we're going to take off the bottom and this is the main circuit board and you'll notice something that looks like a motor the back of a motor here and this is where the motor is you can take that off and it's actually going to be rather difficult to take this off I ended up breaking this one but it's okay because this is all in the name of science it looks like there is a lot of um, glue um, holding this motor in. So this is the motor here. You can see it is maybe a little bit difficult because of the lighting. You can see that there's a motor here and the motor um, trans, uh, transmits to this shaft here. There's a shaft that comes out that I actually broke um, and would be receiving one of the, the gears. And on this side is the potentiometer. And I'm going to remove the potentiometer here. There's a little screw, Phillips screw in here that I can take out. You can see the potentiometer here. 
and this is just a variable resistor and when it turns it gives you a, um, a different voltage on the middle pin if there is a ground and power here as we've um, as we discussed in a in the in the potentiometer video and when this turns when the motor turns this very slowly it will be able to give you or it will be able to give itself feedback on what position it is in and the maker of the the actual um, servo has its own proprietary chip that will take the information from the from the potentiometer it will power the motor and tell it which direction it needs to go to match the position where um, we are intending it to to be positioned and the three wires that are involved in this particular servo is the the yellow which is the signal the red which is the power and the black which is the the ground and the yellow the the, the red would be a power between um, I guess three and six volts uh, and this was this would be just a continuous power to to make sure that the the motor has full power the whole um, the whole time the signal is actually a PWM a pulse width modulation and this is used to send the information to the the circuit of what position we want and then it turns the motor and matches the position with the potentiometer and what position the potentiometer would be positioned at the time. I mentioned two terms that may cause a little bit of head scratching and that was torque and PWM, pulse width modulation. Torque is the turning force that is needed to rotate an object. In the case of a motor, I'm going to draw the front face of a motor, and then you'll have a shaft in the center of this motor. Let's say the shaft is about that big. You'll have the center of the shaft, and the shaft will rotate either in this direction or in this direction. And torque is always in the units of a force and length. And this tells us quite a bit about what torque is, because torque is actually the measurement, the length here, is the measurement from the center of the shaft outwards. And the force is the amount of force that the motor can turn its shaft with that amount of force applied to that point of length. For example, let's say we have the motor again, and we have a shaft, and we have an arm that is connected to that shaft coming outwards. And this shaft is, let's say, one inch in length. Actually, this would be measured from the center of the shaft. So if it was the center of the shaft, it would be measured from here. And let's say that the motor wanted to turn in this direction. And let's also say that this motor is rated, let's say, um, 100 ounce inch of torque. And that means that the motor would be able to push the amount of force of 100 ounces at one inch away from the center of the shaft in the direction that it was turning. The stall torque is generally how a lot of motors are rated and that's where you could push back onto that part of the shaft or the, the arm. Now let's say this, the, stall shaft, the stall torque was 100 ounce inch. You could be pushing against this pivot arm at 100 ounces of force and it would stall the motor. But any less than 100 ounces, if you had 90 ounces uh, pushing against this, um, this arm, the motor would still be able to turn. And if it was more than 100 ounces, if it was say 100, 110 ounces, then the motor, uh, the pivot arm, then the arm would be actually moving in the opposite direction. There is a relationship between the force and the, the length. The formula is torque is equal to the length times the force. Knowing that this has a relationship to each other, if this motor was rated at 100 ounce inch, this is one inch, then if it was at the two inch mark, you would only need to apply 50 ounce inches to stall this motor at this point of the arm. If this were at the half point of the arm, this would be 200 ounces. So the closer to the shaft you are, to the center of the shaft, the more mechanical advantage the motor is going to have. So this also lends to the understanding of using gears or belts 
to gain a mechanical advantage because if you have a, a very um, if you have a belt around this position here and you have a larger shaft that this shaft needs to turn you could have the belt that is wrapped around this larger wheel let's say and the motor would have a mechanical advantage and be able to turn this larger wheel giving the larger wheel much more torque from the center of this shaft outwards to let's say one one inch and the torque relationship depends on the size of this portion and the size of this portion and it's also a easy to understand that the motor would have to be spinning a lot faster to be able to turn this larger wheel. In the servo, there are many gears. There's compound gears and there's a, um, a huge difference between the turning of the motor and the turning of the actual horn on the servo. The motor inside of the hobby servo is actually really, really weak. It's relatively weak. You would be able to stop it very easily with your fingers. But when it comes to um, getting the final torque on the on the shaft of the horn which is would be many times this much it would have a great mechanical advantage and the torque would be much much higher and to understand how torque is affected by gear ratio all you need to do is take your torque let's say the 100 ounce inch and multiply it by the gear ratio let's say if the gear ratio is 1 to 2 let's say 100 ounce times 1 to 2, which is the same thing as saying 1 over 2, that would equal 50 ounces, or 50 ounce inch. And that would be if you had a larger gear going towards a smaller gear. Let's do the reverse. If the gear ratio was 5 to 1, if the gear ratio was, let's say, 6 to 1, which would be 6 over 1, which would be 6, and that would equal 600 ounce inch. Pulse width modulation will be explained in the next video. Thank you for watching. If you are following along with these experiments or producing successful projects on your own, helped by these tutorials, please let me know using the Contact Us page on the NewbieHack.com website. I would like to feature these on the website to benefit and motivate others to join this creative field. Thank you.